Hello, everyone. My name is Carol Shar, and I'm a tour guide at the Jeremiah E. Reeves Victorian Home and Museum in Dover. Did you know that we have a wonderful display in our carriage house dating to early Dover and our surrounding area? This includes artifacts and information from the Canal era, 1825 through 1913. When we need things in today's world, we visit local stores or maybe make a quick drive to Canton. Not so in the early 1800s when our state was just beginning. Roads were non-existent then. No cars, trucks, buses, airplanes. So how did those early residents of Dover get what they needed and wanted, not only to survive, but to make their lives better? Christian Deerdorf, along with his good friend and relative, Jesse Slingliff, founded Dover in 1807, just four years after Ohio became the 17th state in 1803. He chose a spot along the Tuscarawas River because he knew the river would provide what this new little village needed. Coming from his home in eastern Pennsylvania, this was a business venture for Deerdorf. He intended to purchase the land and then sell lots to make money. A good investment, he thought. Interestingly, the purchase price of the 2,175 acres was $4,622. Today, our zip code in Dover is 44622. Among the needs of the new little village would be connection to the world beyond the town. The river would not only be a source of food and water, but would provide a means of transportation. Dover grew very slowly. Because of the nearly impassable trails and few roads, it was difficult to bring people and supplies that were needed into the central part of Ohio. In the 1820s, the government leaders of Ohio came up with a plan to connect the northern and southern boundaries of Ohio. The state of New York had successfully built a canal system, so why couldn't Ohio? They decided to build two canals, one in eastern Ohio that would connect Lake Erie at the small town of Cleveland to Portsmouth on the Ohio River. This canal would be named the Ohio and Erie Canal and would pass through Dover on its way north and south. The second canal, the Miami and Erie Canal, would connect Lake Erie and the Ohio River in western Ohio. A canal is a man-made waterway. Men would need to dig the canal by hand with picks and shovels, an impossible task in our day. At that time, there were many immigrants from Europe who came to America looking for work and a better way of life. They were happy to work from sunup to sundown and receive about 25 cents a day to dig the canal, all 313 miles of it. The building of the Ohio and Erie Canal took just about 13 years. It followed the rivers and was four feet deep, not deep or wide enough for large boats. As motored boats did not exist at that time, an ingenious method of power was needed. The boats would be flat-bottomed and pulled or towed by a team of mules, horses, or sometimes oxen. They would be hitched to the front of the boat with a rope and walk on a towpath built beside the canal. They were often called hay burners. Think about that for a minute. And young boys called hoggies would walk behind them to be sure the path was clear. The canals also provided recreation. Many townspeople rented rowboats for rides on a lazy afternoon, and the younger people enjoyed sometimes swimming or fishing. In the winter, the canals were used for ice skating. Each boat had a captain, and sometimes his family lived on the boat with him. Often laundry was washed by hand and hung on ropes across the boat as it traveled down the canal. Meals sometimes had to be cooked on the boat, and young children secured to the middle of the boat by a rope to keep them from falling off. Life on the canal boats was not easy. They traveled from town to town, picking up materials and packages and delivering them to people who would purchase the goods. It was a sort of early mail order system. 
Even farm animals or livestock were shipped on canal boats along with barrels of grain, kegs of nails, fabric for clothing, building materials. The captain received payment for carrying these products on his boat. Some boats were passenger boats called packets. Only people would travel on these boats. For a small amount of money, you could travel from Cleveland to Akron or Coshocton or Marietta. The boats moved slowly, four miles an hour, making for a pleasant trip as long as the weather was agreeable. It was at this time that Dover changed its name to Canal Dover. It was also at this time that Canal Dover began to grow and prosper. More people came to settle and new businesses thrived. The canal was a boon to the area. Since Ohio is not flat, but has hills and valleys, high plateaus and lowlands, the rivers often have waterfalls. Boats cannot travel over waterfalls or rapids, so a system of locks was built into the canal. Locks are water elevators with stone walls on two sides and large wooded gates at either end. Small gates called wickets are at the bottom of each large gate. The canal boat would enter the lock, the gates would be closed, and the water level inside the lock made to go up or down by opening or closing the wickets. Then the gates would be opened at the other end and the boat would float out and continue on its way. Lock keepers were paid to operate the locks. To see how the locks worked, close the drain in your bathtub, place a toy boat or a little yellow rubber ducky in it and turn on the water. Watch your ducky float to the top. Then open the drain and see what happens. To pay for the building of the canals, the captain would have to pay a large toll or a fee at toll houses situated along the canal. The amount depended on the type of cargo he was transporting. There is a replica of a toll house near the Tuscarawas Avenue Bridge on Front Street in Dover. There were some disadvantages to the canals, however. Being only four feet deep, they froze during the winter. That meant the captains had to tie their boats up along the side of the canal for winter and find other ways to make money to warm weather. It was then that the canals were used for ice skating. Often the packets were very crowded and noisy with passengers. Sometimes the captains argued and fought over whose boat would pass through the lock first. As time went on, other inventions, including the steam locomotive, which operated on tracks, came to be. Cars and trucks were available. Better roads connected towns. The canal boats were used less as other methods of travel were more efficient. Trains could travel wherever tracks could be laid and weren't stopped by ice and snow. They could carry more people and goods faster and farther than the canal boats. The final blow to the canals came in 1913 when a terrible amount of rain caused a huge flood in our part of Ohio. Towns were flooded and the rivers washed into the canals destroying them. It was the end of an era. Over 80 years of canal boat travel was ended. In our area, you can still see bits of the original canal here and there near the rivers along with remnants of many locks. We hope you'll visit us at the Reeves home when we open later this summer. You can spend a little time browsing our displays, including our lovely canal display, and then tour our wonderful home. Thank you for spending time with us today.